Okay, let me go ahead and get us started today. Um, so welcome uh, to the first Harvard Medical School Ethics of Health Systems and Institutions seminar of the academic year. Um, I just wanted to say a word about the series before we get started with our conversation today. Uh, so generally speaking, what we're gonna be doing in these seminars over the course of the year is looking to gain some insight into what organizations in the health system are facing um, and then to explore the ethical complexities um, therein, and also to look at what it takes for organizations to adopt an ethics lens in their strategy and decision making, and not just in theory, but also in practice. Um, so in some seminars, we're going to be bringing in healthcare leaders like we have today with Dr. Sachin Jain uh, to share their insights and their experience. And then in other sessions, we'll discuss research and different ways of reasoning about the ethical obligations of healthcare organizations. Um, and then we're also bringing in some concrete examples of ethics-informed organizational strategy um, that we hope we could all learn from. Uh, so I do hope that these seminars leave you with some fodder for research uh, or some ideas for practice to take back to your home institutions. Uh, I'm Kelsey Berry, and I'm the chair of this series and a faculty member at Herbert Medical School Center for Bioethics. Um, and also over at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Herbert University. Um, and I tend to do research on ethics and policy questions that arise at the meso and macro level of American healthcare. Um, okay, so with those kind of opening remarks, let me bring you into today. Uh, we have with us Dr. Sachin Jain, uh, who's graciously agreed to join us to give us some insight into what he's seeing in the healthcare sector. Um, from his post as president and CEO of Scan Group and Health Plan, which is an organization that serves 300,000 patients, uh, mostly out west, based in California, but then also some other states. Um, and it's one of the nation's largest not-for-profit Medicare Advantage plans, um, and also one of the more innovative health and community services uh, providers for older adults. Um, so as I'm introducing Dr. Jane briefly, I actually, I neglected to invite folks to introduce themselves in the chat box. So I gave you a little bit of a model. Um, although we're in a webinar format, you have the option to use the chat box today, I believe. Let me see here. Here we go. All right, now I'm using the chat box properly. Um, <clears throat> and I, I invite all of you to share who you are, where you're located, um, something that interests you. Uh, and then we'll also have some time for Q&A later in today's session. So if you'd like, I'd really encourage you to use the Q&A box in your Zoom screen in order to input your question, just because I fear the chat's gonna go by so quickly. Um, but if you do place a question in the chat, we'll try to track it um, and bring it back to the extent that we can. But um, yes, okay, and as Lauren says, please use the chat. We'd love to hear your thoughts throughout the session. All right, let me get back to Sachin. Um, so I was about to mention that he came to Skin after about four years, or sorry, four years ago, um, after having held leadership positions at Caremore and Aspire Health at Merkin Company, and then also in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and there's a sense in which he's kind of coming home today with today's talk. Having done his undergraduate degree, his medical degree, his business school degree, all here at Harvard, um, and then served also as a lecturer in health policy here and as a practicing physician at the Brigham. Uh, so it's a really warm welcome to you, Sachin, and coming home. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's a huge, huge honor for me. Thank you. So I, I'm really excited about having him because in my read, he's one of the keenest observers of transformation and innovation in the healthcare sector. Um, and what's particularly pertinent for us in this forum today uh, is how he particularly focuses on the values-based tensions that tend to arise for healthcare organizations um, and just generally health organizations and their leaders in what is clearly an evolving and sometimes faltering healthcare industry. Um, so we can't possibly get to everything that Dr. Jane has to offer, but I'm hoping that our conversation will take us to some of his insights on healthcare mission, markets, justice, and what it takes to have an ethics lens in organizational leadership and strategy. Um, 
And that is exactly why uh, I've asked my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Lauren Taylor, to join us in anchoring today's conversation. Uh, so Lauren is fairly well known, I think, to a lot of you already as a frequent contributor to this consortium on the ethics of health systems and institutions. Um, and formally, she's a management scholar, she's an ethicist, and she's an assistant professor uh, at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. What you might not know, hi, Lauren, <laughs> what you might not know about Lauren um, is she's one of the foremost academic experts on the ethical complexities of healthcare markets and how organizations navigate them while maintain, maintaining trust and legitimacy, uh, which will bring a richness to our conversation today that I could not hope to match myself. So big thanks to Lauren for anchoring our conversation with Sachin today. All right, um, with those kind of introduction, brief introductions on the table, I think what I'd like to do is just get us started by getting to know you a little bit better, uh, Sachin. So could you tell us about how you ended up at SCAN, just a little bit about your journey, uh, what it's looked like and what brought you to this point? Yeah, so my, my journey begins in, in New York City where I was born in, uh, 1980, a million years ago now. Um, at, to the, I was the youngest son of an immigrant physician father, um, who came to this country to pursue advanced training and then planted roots. Um, and so I grew up in a in a physician, um, family or household. Um, grew up in northern New Jersey, uh, and then you know, as you mentioned, um, and came to Harvard. Um, when my uh, when I came home my freshman year from. Uh, college uh, at Thanksgiving, uh, I told my parents I might like go to might like to go to law school because I was really interested in these questions about justice and kind of uh, uh, the and how to change society more broadly. And my father said, you know, you really have two options. You can uh, not he didn't say it quite this way, but he said you could really be a doctor um, or you could be a physician. <laughs> and, he said, <laughs> and he said you can go to law school after you go to medical school. I mean, that was the encouragement he gave to me. Um, and so I, I was if a medic, I was an undergraduate student who ended up studying political science uh, and was really interested in, in kind of bigger questions of like, how do we make a better healthcare system for people? I wasn't sure how I would put that together in a career. Um, my junior year of college, I wandered into a class called Quality of Healthcare in America. And it was taught by uh, people who I now know are giants in the field, but were strangers at the time. One was Don Berwick, um, who uh, founded, went on to, at the time had just founded the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, and then the other was Howard Hyatt, who had been the Dean of the uh, Harvard School of Public Health. So I was, you know, in this classroom and um, it was probably the easiest course to teach in the world because they just invited their friends to give lectures um, and they stood by and, and, and read our papers. And that was the course, but they had really impressive friends. And I met, you know, just an incredible group of people who are trying to change the healthcare system in different ways. Um, health services researchers, leaders of large organizations, um, government officials. And um, I didn't exactly know where I would take it, but I had a sense like that I had found my tribe, that there was a group of physician change leaders who were recognizing issues in quality, access and disparities and were committing their careers to actually addressing those problems. So I went to medical school with that lens. Um, and then along the way, thought I would do a master's in public policy. Don was kind of my guru at the time. I thought I would follow his academic training. And, and my brother said to me, he said, you know, um, you know, you were a government undergraduate. Uh, you know, a lot of healthcare happens at the interface of business and medicine. So why don't you apply to business school? Um, and had never thought about that. So, you know, met some MD, MBAs, um, and felt like it was a really interesting training pathway. And so ended up finding finding myself in business school. Um, and so decided to forego the master's in public policy and then was in, in business school. And around that time, I was connected with Michael Porter, who was starting to kind of promulgate this idea of value-based healthcare. And then I ended up apprenticing myself to him um, for a number of years, uh, just as the term value-based healthcare was entering vogue in, in American healthcare. Um, you know, several years later, uh, was in residency and um, and then uh, mid residency, um, Barack Obama was elected president. And I thought, wow, this is a guy who actually wants to change healthcare, And this is like a once in a 50 year or once in a 100 year window 
Uh, so um, I called everyone I knew who was headed to the Obama administration in a senior capacity and said, do you need someone to carry your bags? Um, the first person who called me was David Blumenthal. Uh, and so I ended up working with David, um, working as his chief of staff and special assistant, uh, mm -hmm. you know, during the you know implementation of the High Tech Act, uh, and then um, ended up uh, working at CMS, where I was part of the founding team at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation when Don Berwick was the administrator of CMS. Then went back to finish my residency um, and then was faced with this question of like, you know, I'm somebody who wants to change healthcare, kind of seeing how it happens at the policy level, um, but I want to do it in the real world. And then faced this like incredible crisis of confidence because as I went to meet with health systems leaders around the country who were trying to implement policies that were articulated in the ACA, I sensed a, a deep degree of half-heartedness. Um, and I just felt a little bit of, um, uh, you know, kind of confusion about what, I, what, what it was that I was seeing. Um, there was what people were saying, and then that were, there was what people were doing, and then there was how people were resourcing it. And it was a theme that I'm going to come back to, I think we'll come back to a lot in this discussion, like the gap between what organizations say and what they do. It was the first time I really had to confront that head on. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pause there, but I would say like my career since then, whether it was Merck, Anthem, Caremore, Aspire, uh, you know, Scan, uh, you know, kind of my academic studies of, of the health of the healthcare system, you know, my, my various advisory roles across the industry. Um, you know, the thing that wakes me up every morning with a certain degree of anxiety, um, in addition to whatever the day's crisis is is really this gap between who we say we are and who we actually are in American healthcare. And I see this tension playing out everywhere. Um, you know, on the to topic of ethics, I would just reflect on the fact that at every stage of my career, there was an ethics component. Uh, as, at Harvard Medical School, there was a bioethics course uh, that Walter Robinson taught. Um, when I was an undergraduate, uh, you know, I took Michael Sandel's course, Justice. When I was at Harvard Business School, there was a course called uh, Leadership. I forget what the C was. It, leadership and accountability. accountability. Yeah, le leadership and corporate accountability. And and so these questions of like ethics and distributive um, justice and how to lead a just organization have just kind of been at the center of like my considerations um, throughout my career. And I would say th those courses just made a really, really strong impression upon me as I took them. And some of the, you know, even, you know, some of the first texts that I read in Michael Sandel's justice course, you know, still come to mind, you know, on a pretty regular basis, which is maybe how I ended up here uh, in this conversation with all of you. Um, but I also don't feel like we we grapple with some of those tensions enough. Um, I think about the term ethical erosion a lot. Um, it was a term I was introduced to in medical school to describe the kind of loss of of ethical behavior, you know, among medical trainees from first year of medical school to the fourth year of medical school and beyond. And I would say that there's a corporate version of that too. Uh, and I would say it starts with people starting out in a career in on the business side of healthcare, wanting to help people and wanting to make a difference. And by the end of their careers, it's, you know, they're mostly focused on wanting to pay for their vacation homes um, and make sure that they can, you know, fund their kids graduate school. Uh, and, you know, the, the tension that people, you know, should feel about the decisions that they're making every day aren't necessarily felt as acutely as 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 I as you, we would all think they they should be. And I and, and my kind of tagline for that that I now use almost every day at work um, is like normalizing the abnormal. Um, and the examples of that in the managed care industry are many. It's like you know when you call member services and we put you through a phone tree, and we just think that that's just normal. Like a long and extensive phone tree as an older adult that doesn't necessarily lead you anywhere. That's a normal, that's an abnormal thing that we've normalized. Um, you know, utilization management, this idea that we have like sick people with cancer and we're putting them through hoops at a time when they can least afford to go through hoops. That's not a normal behavior that like kind humans would engage in with each other on, but we do it every day. My company does it every day in some form. Um, uh, and so again, I, I think a lot about this question of, you know, normalizing abnormal things, which I think is tied to this notion of ethical erosion. Um, and that's maybe how I come to this conversation today. Yeah, Sachin, I, I wanted to kind of double click on ethical erosion because, you know, I, 
I feel like it's so spot, it's such a spot on term for describing, I think, you know, some of what outsiders looking in might might see happening at, at the kind of helm of healthcare organizations and see, you know, news stories and say like, why, why is it that healthcare organizations that are out to be mission oriented and really facilitating the capacity, you know, their positions to fulfill the Hippocratic Oath and, and all of, you know, all of these things, why is it that they seem to be behaving, you know, so much as I would expect a mere kind of corporate, you know, or more market focused actor to behave. And I, I'm curious about, you know, there's a model at the clinical level, of course, where clinicians can call in ethics support for hard cases that they face um, to, you know, help help them remain aligned with some of the ethical precepts of their profession and to work out, you know, how to resolve conflicting values when when that's the case in patient care. You know, I'm curious, is, is that kind of model um, relevant for the leadership level um, in healthcare or, you know, are there other support structures or accountability structures that we might be overlooking um, to help combat some of this ethical erosion um, in on the on the business side of healthcare. Yeah, I mean I, I would say that we're overcome with an epidemic of shallow thinking in the at the senior levels of organizations. And what I you know I remember the first time I heard the expression, you know, no margin, no mission. Um, and I remember how proudly it was stated by a healthcare executive. Like, if we don't make money, we can't do the things that, you know, people really need us to do. Um, and I've now seen that term kind of used over and over and over again. And on some level, like deeply bastardized in its intent, um, in part because I don't think there's adequate reflection on what the actual mission is or should be for an organization. Um, and so you take every health system in the country which has some version of a no margin, no mission conversation every single day um, as these ethical tensions come up. And it leads them to do things like surprise billing. Uh, it leads them to do things like aggressive debt collecting practices, even though it does, we know it doesn't necessarily materially affect an organization's bottom line. Um, it leads them to terminate, you know, medic, it terminate health insurance programs that cover frail and vulnerable people. Um, it leads them to really redirect their payer mix to you know, away from frail and vulnerable populations, which are an explicit part of the mandate of almost any not-for-profit healthcare organization, to really prioritize commercial business, um, and they say, "Oh, it's no margin, no mission." It leads them to focus on a fee-for-service payment system instead of a value-based healthcare system because they can make an extra buck in one payment model versus another. And I see this play out every single day. Um, and they say, "Well, we've got to keep the lights on." And my question you know, in my kind of quiet thoughts are like, why? <laughs> like, why is it so important that we keep the lights on? Um, are these the right lights to be keeping on? Um, and I think about the difference between hospital systems and health systems. And I would say we have very few health systems in America. We have hospital systems whose business model is to keep hospitals full. Um, but we have very few organizations whose business model is to actually keep people healthy and out of the hospital and to see admissions to the hospital as a failure mode of the healthcare system. Um, and uh, you know, most healthcare organizations believe that they should be operating at full capacity. Um, and they have a belief that there's an infinite backfill of patients who need their services. And that is the first premise that we all have to challenge, which is if we had a system and we had a model of financing and a model of delivery that was actually focused on keeping people healthy, it would look dramatically different. Um, and our our behaviors would be different. Our participation in novel payment models would look different. Um, and I would say, you know, again, lots of organizations have got have been very, very successful doing exactly what they do. So they don't actually take the moment to pause and reflect on these like bigger questions. The question then becomes like, how do we get here? And I would say some of it has to do with the change in the composition of corporate governance of a lot of organizations. So when you look at you know, the um, boards of large health systems, they're largely populated by business leaders, um, business leaders whose businesses really require top line growth year after year after year. And so how do those folks measure the organizations that they're now governing in a board capacity? They're measuring it against top line growth year after year after year. 
how do they actually compensate executives of organizations? They compensate you based on benchmarks that are established based on revenue numbers. And so again, everything is tied to growth. Everything is tied to an ever growing um, sense of doing more. Um, when in fact, we all know that in, in some cases, the right answer for a lot of patients is doing less. And so when we use terms like medical industrial complex, um, we're using it to describe this, this notion that we're going to have a continuous level of inflation in healthcare, which is what we've seen. You know, you, you know and if you read the health policy papers from 30 years ago, um, they would say, oh, the, the amount of GDP that we have devoted to healthcare is unsustainable and it's too much. And today the numbers are double, triple where they were 30 years ago. And the same economists are saying, you know, we have too much money to go to healthcare. Um, but I would say healthcare is big business in this country. It's the largest employer in almost every single congressional district. Um, lots of people derive their livelihood from, you know, our so-called sick care healthcare system. Um, and so I think that that's, these are some tensions that it's more convenient and more comfortable for us to oftentimes ignore and to hide behind glib statements like no margin, no mission. Maybe I can pick up here, Kelsey. Sachin, I just wanted to push on this idea that the fundamental assumption of most health systems or hospital systems is that there's unlimited demand for their services. And I'm totally with you that that's where we need to like check ourselves. But I think if I channel my inner healthcare executive, they might say to you, well, sure, like in a magical alternative universe, we would be structured totally differently. But that's not the universe we live in now, and it's not the universe we've been living in for the past 100 years. And so there actually is a backlog of people who need hospital services. And I wonder if you really don't think that's the case, like empirically? I really don't think that's the case. So what I can tell we you is- Really um, manufactured demand. Well, it's not manufactured demand. I would just say if we were organized different, I, so I don't think that anybody's, so let me be clear. I'm not a conspiracy theorist who thinks that we're like getting people sick yeah. um, in order to like drive up, you know, utilization of pharmaceuticals. And yeah. uh, like, I'm, that's not the position that I'm coming from. But what I am saying is that every quote unquote health system has the capacity to organize itself differently and actually get paid differently um, and get paid for, you know, keeping people healthy as opposed to keeping people sick. And you say, what is that capacity? Well, they can engage in risk-based contracts with commercial payers uh, and, and, gov and, pro and government payers, as well as participate in some of the programs that have come from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that incent organizations, provide robust incentives for organizations to actually invest in outpatient chronic disease management. I would say, if you look at the number one, two, and three Medicare diagnoses, most of them are, uh, you know, for for hospital admissions, most of them are actually sensitive to intensive ambulatory management. So, but what do we actually do for people, uh, for heart failure patients who we might want to see every week or every month, um, where we might want to monitor their weights daily? Um, you know, we we don't do those things, uh, and instead, when they when they arrive in extremis. Uh, with dyspnea on exertion, um, we admit them to the hospital for seven days for, you know, a, a hundred thousand dollar hospitalization. I mean, that's the state of care in America. Um, there's a famous Harvard Business School case study on the Duke University heart failure program, which was focused on outpatient management of uh, of heart failure patients, intensive outpatient management of heart failure patients, sometimes seeing them every day. And they were successful at like dramatically reducing heart failure admissions. And what happened? The CFO of Duke University Medical Center called over to the cardiology department and said, what are you guys doing? Why don't we have as many admissions? And they shut down the program. And, you know, since that case was written, there are countless examples of this. I heard of one recently from another Ivy League academic, you know, medical center. Um, I won't name it just because the story is a little bit fresh, um, where they had built you know, a great substance use disorder outpatient management model that had reduced inpatient admissions and the ethical tensions faced by, you know, the executive who built it um, were, were that, you know, his hospital colleagues were saying, well, where are these admissions going? Um, and he said, well, we're able to reduce those admissions. And, you know, the, the sort of, you know, kind of old guard hospital folks were saying, well, we don't want it. We don't want this program because it's diminishing, you know, volume. And what's going to keep the lights on if we don't actually backfill these patients? So 
Um, do I think that there are some geographies where there's infinite backfill? Sure. So-called infinite backfill, sure. But I also think that there's other places where if we were really focused on the on health and wellness of patients, we would organize our service incredibly differently. And what would need to be different in order for that CFO not to make the call in the Duke case and shut that service down or the successful SUD program? Is it a failure on the policy side? Like the financial incentives just haven't been big enough? Um, is it we're missing structures at the organizational level? We should have a management ethics committee that provides oversight on this? Or is it just a, we need to train the next generation of health managers to have a different sort of ethical intuition? So I think we have a leadership crisis. I think what it takes to get to the top of these organizations isn't what we need at the top of these organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, you know, we also have boards, well-intentioned boards, um, you know, of health systems that ultimately uh, are thinking about, you know, healthcare businesses the same way as they think about their other businesses. Um, you know, if you're in the business of selling hats, um, which a health system board member that I've met in my journeys, uh, you know, uh, was, you know, he he's he benefits from selling as many hats as possible. So if you're in the business of selling inpatient admissions, um, you benefit by selling as many health inpatient admissions as possible. So when the numbers go down, you're not thinking to yourself, um, wow, they're doing a great job keeping people healthy. You're thinking, how come they're not managing this business well? We've got fixed infrastructure. We've got costs that need to be amortized across a large population. Um, and so I believe we have a leadership crisis. I don't think we have people at the top health systems and healthcare organizations who are thinking that their job is to keep uh, people healthy. Um, I think uh, they're, they believe that their job is to keep the organization running. And I would say that's a question that we actually have to that's a premise we actually have to challenge. Um, and, you know, th uh, there are two healthcare organizations that I think very visibly, now, you, you know, you could ask how deep the commitment is, but I'll just talk about them because I think it was bold and and highly visible. They made commitments to put themselves out of business. So, um, you know, one of them is MD Anderson, which for years has said, uh, hey, you know, our, our job is to like put ourselves out of business because we want to eliminate cancer from the face of the earth. What a, what a bold and, and, you know, compelling uh, ambition. Similarly, Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, um, you know, had years ago published an advertisement that said, you know, we're, we're not successful when our beds are full, I think is what they said. Um, you know, we're failing if our beds are full. That was a, a nod in the direction of population health and the idea that like, they really believe that their job was to intensively manage people on an outpatient basis where it's less expensive. You know, if, you, if, if you're somebody who's worked in the business of healthcare, you know that the single, mo you know, single most expensive line item in US healthcare is not drugs, right? Even though that's what it is in the public imagination. It's, hospi it's, it's hospital bed days. Um, and we manage a lot of people on an inpatient side, on the inpatient side, who could be either managed more cheaply on an outpatient side, or could be managed you know, or whose admission could be obviated in the first place if the business model was aligned with health. Um, and I would say I've worked in those environments before, and I can tell you it's possible. Um, it just doesn't scale quite as well because lots of organizations are super successful doing what they're doing. You know, I wonder, sorry, Lauren, I, I, I think, I think um, it's a lot. So as I'm hearing it, I'm kind of like, where is the clinician? in all of this. Um, it's it's a lot of um, pressure, I think, placed on the healthcare leader to say like, hold your moral compass. We're gonna do what we can to train you to have health as your kind of highest priority. And then below that, you know, doing, doing something with respect to offering healthcare services, but that always is secondary, right? To, to kind of health. And, um, you know, we know that that individuals who are called to, be their best selves are often most successful when they are in an environment of support for that to emerge. Um, and, and that they're very susceptible to kind of little changes in their environments, which can really help them to act, you know, in a way that that's kind of their most ethical or virtuous um, character uh, and, and not also. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious about, is there, you know, 
aside from the healthcare leader, do you see other parts of the organization as being part of facilitating this kind of ethics or values-based leadership? Um, or are you looking outside the organization in a sense, right? In, into kind of the policy space and the frameworks within which organizations sit. So I guess what, what besides the, the kind of re-education or, or new education um, of, of business leaders in healthcare do you think would be supportive? Look, I, you know, I, this is going to be a little bit of a controversial take, but I'll, um, I will uh, go out on a limb and, and actually make the observation that I think physicians have largely abdicated their um, the more their moral opportunity to exercise more power in in the leadership of healthcare organizations. And I, and I, allow me to explain myself before the text thread blows up. Um, you know, there's always that person in the room uh, in every you know group of physicians who like stands up and says the thing that needs to be said. And that person usually vanishes in three months, nine months, 12 months, or 18 months. <laughs> but I, you have to ask the question, why do they vanish? They vanish because no one else stood up after they spoke and said, I agree. I think the thing that that person thinks. Um, and by the way, when they vanish, they get employed. They're like, down the street and re-employed, re-employed, re you know, a week later, a month later, or six weeks later, because we do have a physician uh, shortage in this country. And so th the ability for physicians to advocate, because there's always such great demand for their services, to advocate for a different way is higher than it is for almost every other profession. At the same time, the grumbling that happens in, in the workroom rarely makes its way into a constructive form. And again, I think when it does make its way into constructive form, it's because there is someone who is either smart enough or dumb enough to kind of say say out loud what needs to be said. <laughs> um, uh, but organizational culture will kind of expel the the person who who sticks out, right? So my real strong um, push on this is that we have to kind of create cultures where, like, there's almost a swarm around the right thing, right? Like we know that, you know, some of the things that are happening in American medicine, consolidation, you know, the sloppy implementation of EMRs, uh, the the implementation of like completely out of, you know, non-normal productivity standards um, for, for clinicians, um, all of those things, you know, need, need a response, but they're not necessarily happening um, because... We don't, we don't, we haven't created a space in organizations where people can actually do that. But I would say it, it, you know, physicians of all the professional lines are most capable of speaking up and speaking out. Um, but when I have private conversations with friends who are practicing physicians about, you know, their problems, their gripes, they're more than happy to kind of blow up my text threads <laughs> about their problems or get on the phone and rant to me for an hour. And then at the end of it, when I'm like, well, why don't you speak up? They're like, ah, I don't really want to, it's a waste of my time. I don't really want to engage in that. But I, again, our, because we haven't engaged in ownership of the healthcare system as frontline physicians, we've become, be, we've become the object of the system as opposed to the drivers of the system. Um, and, you know, physicians have become line workers. They've largely become invisible cogs in larger and larger systems. Um, and so I think like there is a movement to be built with uh, by physicians who uh, who speak up more. Um, but again, it, it a lot of it has to do with resetting our, our organizational dynamics where that one bold person who speaks up is not the exception, but is actually more how we show up as a profession. That's that's my personal view of it. And I know it's it's probably a little bit controversial and people think it's unrealistic and and um but I, but I also think that it, it, we need, without that, you know, everything's going to just keep going the way it's going. If we have a leadership crisis and yet you exist and you feel this way and think this way, I can't help ask you, like, how do you guard against your own ethical erosion? You know, so I would just say, honestly, I think about that a, a decent amount. My path to leadership wasn't like most people's path to leadership, to be really candid with you. Um, I had some really amazing mentors early in my career. Um, I was coming out of a, a, a role at Merck, um, you know, which, you know, uh, was focused on totally different things. And I got a call, you know, really out of the blue from a woman named Liba Lesson, 
who um, had been leading Care More Health for a number of years, an amazing person. Um, and she said, hey, I'm looking for a successor. Would you would you come and do this? Would you come and be my chief medical officer? And then you can succeed me when I feel like you're ready. And um, I was 34 years old. Um, I hadn't been bastardized by corporate anything at that point. <laughs> um, I had I had sort of a very rapid ascent. And I think because of that, I, I didn't learn any of the bad things that you learn along the way that you're in an organization for a long time. And I think that I had a very atypical career progression. And that's allowed me to be to kind of stay a little bit closer to myself. Um, mm -hmm. Because I do think that the process of climbing the ladder in most healthcare organizations is some form of a lobotomy. Um, where it, wherein common sense starts to go out the window um, and you just end up playing the game rather than being focused on changing the game. And so, um, again, I just, I think I got lucky in that regard, or sometimes I think it was a little bit of a punishment, honestly, because I can't unsee these things that, that kind of happen every day that don't feel right. Um, and sometimes I wish I would, would be able to unsee it. I had one, I asked one healthcare leader how they contended with like, all the situations that, you know, that we see every day that, that challenge us. And he's like, well, man, when it gets too stressful, I just pull the blanket over my head. <laughs> and I think about that. I think about how many people may have just pulled the blanket over their head and they're just waiting to come out at a time when it feels a little bit safer. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, that is part of the dynamic. I had a mentor when I was graduating from Harvard's Divinity School, and I was about to enroll at Harvard's Business School, who said, be careful, Lauren, these places work on you. And that's exactly what he meant. Like you go in and you spend time in a place and you just sort of start to adapt and adopt the worldview of the place you're in. Yeah, nobody nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I wanna deny claims when I grow up, <laughs> <laughs> right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I wanna make it really hard for people to access healthcare so we can actually you know, deliver a better bottom line. Um, but somewhere along the way, we can kind of tell ourselves a different story about that. We can say, well, we're promoting the affordability of healthcare yeah. by eliminating unnecessary care. And that's actually true, right? Like you, we actually need, um, you know, utilization management, but we have to be super clear about when and where we need it and when and where it's actually getting in the way. And then there's the question of how we do it, right? Like right now we put people through hoops, um, but the answer for the whole industry needs to be, we should just do it at the point of care. Like if someone meets criteria, we should authorize it. If they don't meet criteria, we should deny it. But mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be done three weeks later by a stranger sitting in a foreign land who doesn't know you or doesn't know your care. Um, it should be done at the point of care so that there can be clarifications or edits if they need to be done at that point. But I think, again, these are the challenges that we've, we, these are the things that we've normalized in the course of of creating the healthcare system that we have. Mm -hmm. Kelsey, do you want to jump in? I could keep going, but I'm. <laughs> I maybe maybe just to press because we're getting some questions from the audience. So I just wanted to bring you know at least one of them in at this point. Um, you know, thinking about uh, the idea of influencing up, right, or or creating a swarm um, of of standing up. You know, the one of the questions actually from uh, Becca Brendel. Uh, who I think we are all familiar with in some capacity, um, is uh, about the unionization movement and the idea, you know, now we've got half of physicians are employed, their movements towards unionization amid unprecedented burnout. Um, and so Beck is asking about, um, you know, regardless of whether physicians really have the power to change the systems, like why is it that frontline physicians are struggling so much? How would we reset? Um, you know, even physician-led organizations seem to have struggled, for example, with burnout. Um, so just curious, you know, if you wanted to say a little bit more about that, where you see this, maybe structures for the swarm, and then also, you know, the extent to which they're capable of addressing some of the distress and burnout that really seems to be festering at the level of practice. Yeah, look, I, I think things may have to get worse before they get better. That's not a, you know, and, and so the idea that we're going to kind of solve the burnout crisis while we're going to fix the whole healthcare system is I think a little bit unrealistic. Um, I think what, what needs to happen um, at a higher level is I, I think we need to create the kind of advocacy around what's right. And I'll say like, I've just been in a couple of instances where there should have been more physician advocacy and there wasn't. 
And I just want to point them out because they were kind of pivotal moments in my career. So I mentioned that I was working for David Blumenthal during the implementation of the High Tech Act. For those of you who are less familiar with the High Tech Act, it was the part of the Recovery Act in 2009 that um, actually gave doctors and hospitals federal funds to implement electronic health records. Like how we implemented electronic health records may have been the most significant change in the practice of medicine over the last 30 years, okay? I was in the position of opening all of David Blumenthal's mail at the time, right? I saw every piece of correspondence that crossed his desk. We got countless letters from industry trade associations talking about how they could get more from the act and the implementation of the act and what they wanted to see in it. But the perspectives of frontline physicians were almost entirely absent from the agency. There wasn't, there was, there, there were two letters from actual frontline physicians um, of, of all, of all the correspondence about this act. Now you could say, well, you know, they should have done a better job, um, you know, soliciting the opinions of frontline doctors. Nonsense. I mean, this was a large change that was actually going out. Uh, this was a, a huge boon to doctors and hospitals. Uh, there were incredible opportunities for people to kind of weigh in and say, hey, this is what I think about this. This is how it should be done, right? This is how, th those voices were completely absent. So we hide behind burnout. I'm just gonna say, this is a hard message to deliver. I'm gonna say it, we hide behind burnout. We hide behind, hey, like every other profession finds a way to kind of advocate for itself. I think physicians need to kind of own that part of their, their profession. Otherwise, things are just gonna happen to you. Um, and I would say there were things that, that went deeply wrong at the, at the implementation of the High Tech Act. Um, the most significant of which was we, we, we didn't lead with interoperability. Um, and like that should have been the first and foremost consideration. But instead, we've seen data as a competitive asset instead of seeing it as a facilitator of actually um, taking care of patients. And again, um, I would just say that was a perspective that lots of smart physicians were very intelligent profession could have brought to the fore um, through their own advocacy, but they left the advocacy to the business interests in healthcare. They, and so things didn't go as well as they could have. And, you know, there's just countless examples of this, how fee schedules are established, how payment programs are implemented. These are things that actually matter to your livelihood, where if you just lean out um, and say, I'm burnt out, think, you know, things are going to get worse. They're not going to get better. Sachin, if you have the policy experience you have and you've seen the policy implementation go wrong in part because the right voices weren't at the table, what makes you so confident that the current state of affairs is a leadership crisis rather than policy crisis? Um, because I don't necessarily, you know, there certainly is a policy crisis too. Let's just, let's just say that, you know, to say otherwise would be, would be silly. Um, but I just think that there are lots of vehicles today through which organizations could do more of the right things and fewer more of the right things and fewer of the wrong things and i see organizations leave them on the table um because there is there is not the leadership intent around driving change um you know and and frankly we're we're rewarded for incrementalism more than we are re rewarded for driving like big scale change um you know how many like healthcare systems are really making big, huge bets right now on population health, changing their whole models. There's lots of organizations that say they are, but when you actually double and triple click and see how much is actually risk-based or how much is really, you know, um, value-based healthcare, um, it's window dressing over a fee-for-service chassis. Um, even Geisinger, you know, you know, one of the largest, most renowned, quote unquote, integrated value-based healthcare, um, you know, what, what I'll say is the following, 25% uh, of their patients are in their health plan. That's not, that's not a fully integrated system. And a lot of the underlying payments to clinicians are fee for service. So the, you know, we are, we haven't really made the move to, to do more of the right thing and less of the wrong thing. You know, I, I'm sensitive to one of the comments in the chat as well about kind of the idea of clinicians being, you know, stepping up and, and really kind of being part of facilitating this movement, um, but also lamenting in a sense, like the lack of training for how to operate or situational awareness about, you know, 
operating at different organizational levels. And you know, I recall one of the kind of details I read about your background, Sachin, was that you were a real proponent for integrating health policy education into medical training. You know, and so I'm kind of curious about, you know, whether that was an early indicator of this view that you're kind of sharing with us now. Or 100 you know. percent. And actually, I'll tell you, you know, I lost my father last fall, um, so I, I don't want to speak critically of him. But my my father was a, an amazing physician who um, he led the pain management service at Sloan Kettering for for much of his career. He started that service, um, really very compassionate doctor. But when it came to thinking about like issues outside of his lane, right, which is cl clinical cancer pain management, um, he had zero interest and zero knowledge. But he had, you know, he had, I, I shouldn't say he had zero interest. He had zero knowledge. And to, you know, to your point about having the tools, like didn't even know what questions to ask because he wasn't equipped with them in the course of his medical training in India and in New York, you know, in the 70s. Um, and there were things I felt like he should know. There were things I felt like my classmates should know. And so, yeah, when I stepped into medical school um, and saw this void and saw, I thought it was preposterous, frankly, that in, you know, the year 2002, medical students at Harvard didn't have a health required health policy course. And so I led a lot of advocacy for that. I worked with the Commonwealth Fund um, to start chapters of a, of a new health policy education group um, that's ended up scaling to, to 16 different medical schools. And over time, there's there's been more and more of this integration of these topics into, into medical education. But there's also the fact that it's like treated like it's a sideshow. It's like a side course, like ethics is it's devalued a little bit in the curriculum. Um, and so I, I actually kind of pushed the envelope a little bit further and said, maybe we should reset pre-med curricula and actually have a medical humanities requirement because it is it is too much to incorporate into medical schools. There's more and more medical science that's being developed every every day. And there's a different set of issues that become relevant when you're a practicing clinician. But what if you know, in addition to your six or seven core science classes, we added a medical humanities requirement or a medical science requirement at a time when you're most motivated to perform, to learn. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I do think we have to rethink the training of physicians. Um, and then the other thing I think is we have to stop talking about leaders. I want to go back to this leadership concept because I think we we tend to think of title holders in healthcare as leaders, the chief of the service, the chair of the department the vice president of ambulatory care, the, the chief operating officer, the CEO. I don't think your title correlates with leadership at all. Um, so that like, you know, the issue that I'm talking about is, is also incorporating, you know, a broader view of leadership. When I think of leadership, I think of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, <laughs> um, like people who go against the grain, right? Maybe even go against their personal interest or financial interest to pursue a higher good, to pursue something that's right. Who are those people in American medicine today? I'll tell you, one of the biggest losses of innocence for me was like, you know, there's lots of people who write great books on these topics. I reached out to one of them, you know, to ask them to speak at something. And um, $100,000 speaker fees, $150,000 speaker fees. Um, so the people who write about how dysfunctional the healthcare system, you know, actually in some ways promote the dysfunction of the healthcare system by profiting from it um, personally. And so again, I just I just want to kind of make sure we we drive higher degrees of self awareness around. We have a medical industrial complex. We have an academic complex that's built around this idea that like that profits from the dysfunction of the healthcare system, and it's just something that we have to kind of like go to war with a little bit in a bit more of a deliberate way. Um, we may have to start naming names. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I sometimes struggle with some of the things that the Lown Institute puts out. Um, uh, in part because there was a time when they, act, I would say inadvertently, were going to include us, include my company on the Shkreli Awards list. But I actually love the idea. You know, they they were kind and and retracted it because um, it was something that was a little bit dated from before I even was there. It was from 2012. Um, uh, but the idea is that I think like shaming Oregon, like shame is a very powerful motivator. We have a ton of very shameful behavior going on that doesn't go recognized or discussed or managed. And I just think that maybe the tactics going forward have to be a little bit more shame oriented. Like let's name names. Um, let's name what the speaker fees that people charge and where they go uh, and who those people are. Let's talk about the, the lists of systems that are, um, you know, engaging in billing practices that are predatory 
to poor people. Um, you know, let's talk about the hospitals that are not taking Medicare anymore. I mean, we just have to start talking about the things. Um, and again, I think we're all very polite. Uh, but I, we also have to remember some of us are very are in, are are in privileged positions where we're able to advocate and we're able to have some of us have tenure uh, are, and are impossible to fire. <laughs> um, and once those things I happen, mean... <laughs> you don't yet, Lauren. But when you do, I'm just saying, I'm right? Kidding. Like my my yeah. point is my yeah. point is is like those those are the situations where we have to start to go out on a limb a little bit more because. Again, one of the biggest challenges I've experienced as a rising healthcare professional executive is just the hypocrisy. You know, the guy who gives a speech about hand washing who then doesn't wash his hands in the bathroom. I mean, these are things I've seen or heard about with my, you know, with my own ears or, or with my own eyes. Um, like that we just kind of normalize because we we there's a hustle. Um, you see it playing out with health equity right now. How many organizations have named chief health equity officers? They give speeches, they go to conferences. Um, but they're not saying the thing that actually needs to be said, which is my organization isn't really doing the things <laughs> that it should be doing. Um, because it, you get a C-suite title and you're part of a team and you're and sometimes self-preservation. And the, you know, I I I I want to say this carefully. Sometimes we become the thing that we rebel against, right? Like sometimes to your point, Lauren, we become co-opted into the medical industrial complex. Um, and that's, again, I have to monitor that myself and I have to measure that myself. And there's things that I've been a part of that looking back, I'm like, oh man, I, that was kind of, that was kind of shitty that I was part of that. Um, but again, we have to be able to have that conversation and have some kindness for each other and compassion for each other. Um, that's, that's just how I think about it. I have so much to follow up on. One is just a reflection. Um, and sometimes, um, I have a background in ethics and management and people think like, oh, that's so idiosyncratic, weird. And I feel like you're a kindred spirit in this respect, but my feeling is like so many of our ethical failures are really managerial failures. Like we just weren't willing to put in the elbow grease and like push down a change in incentive plan or actually change a workflow. And so this isn't really a question so much as like an open-ended, how do you see the relationship between ethics and management? and do you think we need to be talking more about ethics explicitly or like we don't need to talk about it just like hit your mark managerially and you're going to wind up with a more ethical organization an organization of higher integrity so i don't i actually don't know that many people have even been given space to think the way you're talking about lauren i think most people view their like you know at, at the simplest level most people believe that their job is to do the job their boss asked them to do right like hire a person you know, build a team, execute on an initiative. There isn't a, not a lot of like upfront reflection. I think ethics is probably the wrong framing. I think it takes people's head to an inaccessible place. Um, ethics for some, you know, if you haven't been formally trained in it, you know, even if you have, you're like, do I really know how to think about this issue? It takes you to these like no win situations, you know, all, all these conundrums where there's no right answer. Um, when in fact, sometimes there's like absolutely a right answer. Um, but I just don't think most people in the managerial class of healthcare organizations have been trained to think this way. Um, and so they don't necessarily include them included in their decision making. Um, and so I, I think there's incredible opportunity there. I, you know, if you ask me like, Hey, Sachin, you could take a year off right now or two years off and, and like do the one intervention to, that you think would have the greatest impact on like U.S. healthcare today. Um, I would love to find a foundation that was willing to kind of fund a group of people to do board education, um, mm -hmm. and and then build a partnership with like you know American Hospital Association or who you know whatever whatever the right institution is that actually governs health systems. And I would, and I would get them to deeply understand one thing: healthcare is different, <laughs> right? It's it, you know. You know, and again, I think a lot of my mentors in previous generations like tried to do the airline industry thing. They tried to do the consumerism thing. They tried to draw lessons from other industries to try to translate them. Atul Gawande did the cheesecake factory thing. There's always been like the connecting to other examples. And you know, what it always comes down to for me is actually healthcare is deeply different. When you're dealing with life and death, when you're dealing with like you know, human life on the line every single day, the considerations are different, 
the hierarchies are different, the rank orders are different, the priorities are different. And I would just say, like, we've lost that thread. Um, and we've homogenized healthcare with other industries, and we've homogenized the governance of healthcare with other industries. So I, I believe like tone starts at the top. You you got to take the boards offline, retrain them. Um, and you know the truth is is that most board orientation is is very like high level. I mean even our board board orientations. I'm I'm thinking in real time how we we could redo it actually. Um, is like hey this is our business. This is how we make money. These are the key people and players. These are the different committees. Um, and what if you started with like, here's our mission and our purpose. <laughs> and like inherent in our mission and purpose are some deep tensions that you actually have to contend with. Um, and that actually the board culture should should be to surface some of those disagreements that we shouldn't necessarily just be going along to get along. And I'll tell you, I'm I'm really blessed. I have a good, good board in, the, in this regard. But I would say, um, you know, the the program I operate, the Medicare Advantage program, you know, for for better or for worse, is organized to align the incentives where you are able to do better when patients are healthier, not going to the hospital more. Um, again, there's lots of problems with Medicare Advantage. I'm happy to talk about those too. But so, you know, we we you know our um, just as an example, you know, the average for, and we're also not for profit, the average for profit plan in Medicare Advantage targets a 5% margin. And when they don't hit that margin, they start to play with the utilization management, they start to, you know, cut benefits, they start to exit markets, our board, you know, this is actually pretty remarkable, is willing to float our profit target. So in a, in a, in a good year, we target 1%. For the last three years, where there's been lots of cuts to Medicare Advantage, we've been tar targeting zero to negative margin, um, just to be able to continue to provide stability to our, you know, our beneficiaries, um, mm -hmm. and make sure that they're like, we're providing what we say we're providing. Um, cause that trust really matters in our equation. Again, there are things we can be doing better. I don't want to, I think toxic positivity is one of our industry's biggest problems. Like, Oh, our, we're so great. And our organization's great. And we're so awesome. It's all those other folks who have the problems. We have, we have our problems too. I want to say that very clearly. Um, but I would say that that is a, you know, something that our board gets, but I'm not sure industry wide, you know, I think there's a lot of like, Hey, we're not. And I, the other thing I'll just say is we have four physicians and maybe even five soon on our board. I think that makes a huge difference too. Um, Cause when you, when you kind of lay out these trade-offs, they actually understand them in a more intuitive and instinctual way because they've worked in the guts of delivering healthcare. So again, you look at the governance of most healthcare organizations, there's a lot of money people. Um, and those people are important. They write big checks. They make, they put buildings up. Um, super, super important. I don't want to diminish their role. Um, but maybe we should balance the presence of those folks with like practicing physicians within the health system, the chair of medicine, the chair of surgery, so that there is a bit of that balanced perspective. Um, and again, I think those voices are oftentimes outside of the room. And there is this contentious administrator versus doctor energy, um, which, which we have to eliminate from the healthcare system. You know, and I think that we need more physician leaders because of that. I want to go to your experience at SCAN. And um, a lot of the work I'm doing these days is on organizational trustworthiness. And there's a debate among academics about how we should think about the threshold for organizational trustworthiness. Some people say in order to be considered trustworthy, an organization must be willing to put the patient or the beneficiary's interest first. And other people say, that's a totally unrealistic standard. No organization would ever do that. And even if they say it, they couldn't possibly mean it. I look at SCAN's website and it is incredibly explicit. It says with SCAN comma, you come first, you meaning the beneficiary. And I just wonder about your reaction to that debate. And if you really think like operationally, you are able to put the beneficiary first, how does that shake out on the kind of nuts and bolts of how you run the business? Look, I'm going to say the following. Um, I think we're good, but not great at that. Uh, it is a pay, it is something we put on the website. I think we're better than our competition at this. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example, like the little micro examples of how we're better, uh, but then I'll talk about how we need to be better. So um, every single member has my email address, not a fake email address, not a, you know, they have my actual email address. Um, and so I always say, hey, we try to do our best, but if at some point 
you feel like you need to escalate something to me, like I am here and I'm not hiding behind like a wall of people. Um, it's something I've done for the last 10 years. And I can tell you it's it's wildly helpful to me because it shows me what we're like when we're at our worst. It literally shows me what we're like when we're at our worst. Um, and so what I will tell you is I think that's been, um, that helps drive process improvement and it helps drive a lot more trust with our beneficiaries that I'm like in front of them. Um, now, what we could be doing better. Uh, look, we're we're competing against a lot of other folks. We've got to kind of think about ourselves in the context of what they're doing. And we offer benefits the same way that our benefit, our competitors offer benefits. Um, sometimes that leads us to do really weird things. I'll tell you the, the weirdest thing that we do, which we've actually, which we're doing away with this year. So I can talk about it very openly is um, we have this like absolutely ridiculous over the counter benefit. We're like, Hey, we provide you with like $5,000 of over the counter, you know, supplies over the course of the year. They're not really five. Th we're, we're insulting our members intelligence. We're using a catalog where everything is marked up, where diapers are $150, where a toothbrush is $10. Um, and so like, we're literally insulting their intelligence. That's not putting our members uh, members first. And, you know, it was actually a member who wrote me and said, hey, this insults my intelligence. That lead, led me to say, hey, guess what guys, we're going with a different vendor. And so now we're switching to like a debit card that you can take to CVS and we're gonna give people $100 instead of whatever the inflated number is, but it's gonna be a real $100 instead of the inflated benefit. Um, but what I will tell you is the as an organization gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets easier and easier to be less member focused. Um, so one of the things that we, we're, uh, we've historically done that we're in the process of kind of bringing back is actually requiring that anyone who's not in a patient or member facing role, so actually has to have a member that they talk to on a regular basis. Um, and like they have to log their encounters with that person and actually like share what they learned from engaging with that person. Um, and again, it's just to be able to kind of remind people who it is that we're there to serve. Um, and then the last thing we're doing is is actually we just hire, we're in the process of, of hiring the ex Disney CEO um, to actually like help us think through like what it means to really think about your customer. Um, and, you know, you, you may know he was, sort of famously pushed out in the last couple of years. Um, it was kind of covered in the pages of the New York Times. It's actually a very riveting article if you haven't read it. Um, but I know him from a, you know, he's a very decent person. I know him from um, uh, the board of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And I asked him if he would just spend some time with us to try to help us make healthcare a little bit more patient-centered, not in kind of the cheesy, cheesy way that Disney sometimes does, but in the way of like, hey, we're going to really put ourselves in the shoes of the people we serve. Um, and again, I think that that, that's just a different kind of thinking that we're trying to bring to the table. So then how do you guard against, I mean, on one hand, I think amazing, who better to help you think about customer focus. And on the other hand, I think you just told me that healthcare is really different. And what's the kind of process for taking in? I think we're going to be teaching him just as much as he teaches us. I mean, just to be super clear about it. Like, like, I don't think he's going to come in and give us a playbook. And, um, you know, we once talked to, um, the CEO of a fast chain, uh, fast food chain, who had then pivoted to run a chain of medical clinics. And like, sometimes the messenger actually really matters to people, to be, mm -hmm. to be honest, like, you know, um, they would maybe hear a message better from the guy who ran Disney it might be the exact same message. So some of this is me trying to get people to hear something through a different voice. Um, so again, it's a, it's a big experiment. I think, I think, I think it'll be terrific. Um, hope, hopefully he says, yes, we're just exchanging, um, scopes right now, but that's, that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. Um, I wonder, as you mentioned earlier, that scan was a nonprofit plan. And I wonder whether or not you feel as a manager that meaningfully restricts your range of motion. Like, are there things that you can't do? that your competitors could, because there's always this knock, like especially on the healthcare delivery side, nonprofit, for-profit, they behave identically. Yeah, no, look, I think we're in, yes. And look, there are not-for-profits that act fully like a for-profit and then there's not-for-profits that act like a not-for-profit. I think we're um, we're in a David versus Goliath battle in healthcare. I mean, I run a $5 billion revenue organization, but 
I'm going up against $300 billion revenue organizations. So it seems big on some days, but it seems super small uh, on other days. Um, you know, most of these organizations make more, you know, more, most of our competitors make more in profit in a quarter than we make in revenue in a year. Right. Um, and so like Humana this year is not signal that they're going to shed 250,000 members. Um, that's how, you know, that's how many members we have in California, uh, almost in totality. Right. So the, the, the reality is, is that we have to make different choices, um, than they do, you know, to really try to differentiate ourselves. Um, and I think it's it's really, really hard. And I think that's the scale game is one that is really complicated and challenging. Like what, how much scale do you really need in healthcare? Scale has been used as an excuse to engage in a lot of bad behavior in healthcare. At the same time, I can tell you like the dynamics are just as I described, they're they're really complicated, they're really difficult. We're dealing with a lot of, a lot of you know, big, big players. Um, I would say the big difference is what I described before. I, I can, I can, in the in the name of the member, I can not cut benefits in a year when my revenues are going down um, because I've got reserves. Now my reserves aren't as big as their reserves, um, but I also don't have shareholders. And so as long as I can convince my board that hey, we shouldn't have copays on all these medicines that really people should just take, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and that maybe maybe we're investing more and we have less profit because we're investing in zero copays across more and more medicines because. By the way, copays are some of the silliest things that have ever been introduced in the history of healthcare. Like, why do we want to create? You know, that's really just a way of cost sharing and shifting cost to skin to skin in the game. Yeah, Gotta exactly. Get that skin in but, the game. but skin in the game is again, skin in the game is almost as bad as no margin, no mission. Right? Like, I agree. why do we need skin in the game for insulin? Why do we need skin in the game for statins? Why do we need skin in the game? Um, and I actually had a co you know I had a call with Congressman Jake uh, Auchincloss from from Massachusetts actually. Earlier this week, he's really focused on this copay issue. Um, and I said to him, you know, I said, look, from a business perspective, um, you know, th there's probably 10 or 12 classes of drugs that represent 60 to 70 percent of people's prescriptions that you, we should just say that there's no copays, no coinsurance. Um, and because they, they they are generic, they are pennies on the dollar. Um, and then, you know, we have to figure out how to do similar things with with more costly drugs. But um, let's just start with the things we can probably operationalize today. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, I think it's great that we have people thinking about these kinds of things. Um, and there's but no moral hazard on the 27th time I refill my insulin. Like this is our econ friends having truly warped our brains with the idea of moral hazard. Totally. And the, it's applied to the wrong, applied to the wrong goods. Um, and so I just think we have huge, uh, huge opportunities to reset our thinking on these types of things. But Again, I think you have to be a clear, you know, you ask like, how do we get people to think differently about these things? We have to appoint a different kind of leader to the leadership of healthcare organizations. I mean, we really, really do. The moral compass has to come from somewhere. And I can just tell you, most organizations play it safe and they just go incremental and they 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 just kind of bump up the next person in the, in the line, um, which again, I think is a very corporate way of kind of thinking about things. Instead of saying like, hey, the world is changing, like what are going to be the competencies that are going to be required to keep people healthy and drive the right healthcare behaviors in the future? Those are the people who should be leading these organizations. It's so tough too, because I've thought about this in bioethics. We're such a mentorship driven sort of field. And you mentioned the hierarchy before, but it's really hard. Your own personal story is one of kind of being plucked from sort of like a, maybe a middling role to a pretty high role, role quickly. And the alternative where you just kind of groom, 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 and people come up the ladder feels, as you said, totally normal and standard for our oh, I mean, listen, field I was, industry and is like so potentially problematic. I once went to a Boston medical leader for a mentorship conversation. I was, I'd been asked to interview for a very senior role reporting to the CEO of a big New York health system. And someone said, oh, you know, you should talk to so-and-so and he might be able to give you some helpful advice. And he just thought I was absolutely nuts um, he was like, oh, you know, in your thirties, you should be doing small projects. And in your forties, you should be running small groups of people in your fifties. Maybe you could run, you know, some larger group of people. And in your seven sixties, you should be running large institutions. Mm -hmm. And then I look at like outside of healthcare, you look at tech, you look at, um, you know, all the places where, you know, people earlier in their career are valued for the qualities that actually come with youth, um, energy, dynamism, fresh thinking, 
um, and how little, how much we devalue people like that. Um, at Harvard, we make you an instructor for 12 years before you even, you know, get a pro professorial rank. Um, it's kind of, it's just, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. Um, you know, and again, but if you look at why those institutions became what they were in their history, it was actually, they took chances on people. When you actually go deep into the history of, you know, large medical institutions and you look at who was running them and what ages they were, um, and how that, how it was that they pushed to push to do new things like the first kidney transplant or, you know, the first neurosurgery, these were done by like really early career people who are, you know, cowboys and cowgirls really trying to like, you know, change, change the face of the game. We dishonor those people today. We actually deeply dishonor those people today. And, you know, so um, we did something recently at, at scan, which is we renamed our employees. They're no longer called associates. Um, they're no longer called employees. They're called rebels. Literally. We want every one of our employee to call themselves calls uh, employees to call themselves a rebel um, and then you, you know, you ask like, what are they rebelling against? And what, what we're asking them to rebel against is like unjust healthcare, um, because there is just so much of it and really to kind of reframe their mindset. Um, you know, one of the happiest moments I have is when, you know, frontline associates said to, said to me, um, you know, we're normal, it repeated that repeated back something I'd, I've tried to drill into people's heads. We normalize the abnormal too much in healthcare. Um, and again, so I think this is where I think the cult, the culture work that we have to do in healthcare is we have to stop being, you know, seeing ourselves as just another version of the same hospital that they have in New York or in Boston or, you know, Baltimore. Um, and like, just really rethink what the heck is, are we doing here? Why are we here? What's the purpose of our organization? And if it's just to stay, stay going, which is how I think most people think of it, then we're completely lost. You know, there's so many things that I think about when you when you when you say the term unjust healthcare. Like it can be so many different um, aspects of the healthcare system. You know, it can be the fact that it is unnecessarily difficult for someone to get their insulin. Um, it can be the fact that you know it is um, uh, soul crushing to practice in a system where you feel that you can't actually facilitate the health of the person in front of you, especially when they're vulnerable and marginalized. You know, and then it's something like the fact that we have these incredible racial and ethnic disparities and socioeconomic disparities too, right? That are right before our eyes and yet nonetheless seem um, under addressed uh, in many places. And so I'm kind of curious, you know, you've written kind of talking about these bold ideas, this idea of a, a need for a civil rights movement in healthcare. Um, and so, you know, I wondered if you wanted to expand a little on that, like what, what part of the civil rights movement would most benefit healthcare right now? If you're thinking, you know, what it looked like historically. Um, well, it's the spirit of pro. It's the spirit of protest, right? I mean, just like if you think about health benefits, what they cost people, the the sort of structure and organization of healthcare of healthcare in the U.S. The middlemen, where it were over proliferated with middle players that provide absolutely no value in the delivery of care, um, but you know, everyone gets their gets theirs. There's a percentage point here, a percentage point there, a percentage point here, a percentage point there, um, and it all adds up to like crushing healthcare costs for a frontline person. Where most people I know these days are afraid to go to the emergency room, and they're not afraid to go to the emergency room because they're afraid that, that someone's going to stick a needle in their arm, uh, mm -hmm. or or that they're going to get a you know uh, half, or that they're sick and they're going to get a bad diagnosis. Um, they're afraid to go to the emergency room because they're afraid of the bill that they're going to get on the other side of that. I mean, that's, that's what most people fear today. Um, and, you know, that's just something that we have to kind of do away with once and for all. I mean, this kind of fear of healthcare. Um, and I, again, it has to, it, it will come from a, some kind of bigger movement, um, which is like a, some form of rebellion against the status quo. Um, and I, and I just think we've, we've normalized the idea that think about access to care. I mean, have, have you gone, tried to see your primary care doctor recently? Um, I mean, m how most people I know access care these days is through some sort of back door. I mean, it's wild. Like most people have some back door. They've like figured out some hack to the system. Um, and they're so proud of their hack to the system. Uh, <laughs> they're like, Oh, I've got this guy and he responds to my texts and, you know, he responds because he knows my friend and 
That's how people access healthcare today. Um, but if you, you know, if you were to call, my, go through the front door for my primary care doctor, who's five minutes down the street from me, um, the wait time for a primary care appointment right now is nine months. That's 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 the state of care today. Um, again, we accept it. We've accepted it, and I think we have to stop accepting it, and we have to kind of demand something different of ourselves. And it's not going to come through consumerism. For those of you who believe in consumerism, I think <laughs> it is probably. You know, when I say healthcare is different, I really mean nobody wants to be a healthcare consumer. <laughs> so, I mean, it's the perfect setup for people to avoid care. So we have to make it as easy as possible for people to access primary care, to take their insulin, to take their metformin, to take their statins. But right now we're in a place where that none of that's none of that's even part of the conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just want to Oh, Lauren, go, go ahead. ahead I was just going to flag for the rest of the group that we've got about 15 minutes left and you and I were going to really try and transition to lifting up some of the Q&A questions and things that might be coming through the chat. Um, so as you're kind of putting your thoughts in the chat and the q and I, I was just, what Lauren and I were talking about the civil rights movement the other day, and um, we were kind of going back and forth with one another about you know, are we at a stage in which there's more protests needed, that kind of early part of the civil rights movement, that's kind of where I see you landing such in that, you know, we, we need those, um, you know, kind of brave souls to really bring about the, the attention to the issues that um, need to be addressed. But then there was kind of the later part where the government really started throwing its weight around, you know, and, and requiring, you know, forms of integration and, and in particular, in, you know, Medicare is a payer really kind of calling for, it. you need to have integrated hospitals and, this might have been, um, you know, something that was left behind in the dustbin of history, in a sense, is like the government really throwing its weight around to address some of these issues. But are there, um, you know, I guess things that the government could be using its power to require that it's not now that. So, so a couple, this... couple of things like in, interoperability right now, right? Like the idea that your medical information is seen as somebody's competitive asset versus your own information, like to facilitate your care across a deeply fragmented healthcare system, ridiculous. It should be a condition of participation in Medicare and Medicaid that mm -hmm. if you receive a federal payment, like you participate in some form of instantaneous data sharing that actually allows people to get data at the point of care. Um, that is like a stroke of the pen kind of stuff. And, you know, people, people treat interoperability in healthcare like it's it's worse than putting a man on the moon. It's harder than putting a man on the moon. Totally. And it is, it is, it is an absolutely wild conclusion that we've come to, <laughs> um, you know, so I would say interoperability, I would say, um, you know, just committing to not engaging in predatory billing practices, um, you know, getting out of this world where we're going to basically ruin your credit for the rest of your life. Um, if you had the misfortune of getting hit by a car and being taken to an emergency room and, you know, you can't pay that $2,500 ambulance bill um, from the LA, from LA County, you know, fire department. That's, that's a problem. <laughs> um, you know, like that in the course of just getting bad luck, we're going to compound your bad luck. And I think in healthcare, we have so much compounded bad luck. Um, so I, again, I think there's a lot of things that can be dealt with with pen stroke. I will say one of my biggest problems with our US policy, like health policy discourse is that it gets lost. Like it's, you know, we're, we're stuck talking about airy fairy things instead of just talking about like the boring, like really the, the most, the most interesting, interesting stuff in healthcare, I think is the most boring stuff, administrative simplification. Like the idea that we've buried medical practices in five different kinds of forms and 12 different ways of submitting quality data. Like we, we need to kind of demand like a single quality reporting infrastructure so that and that's that doesn't require a lot of special work you know talk about eliminating the burnout M most of it is just a failure to actually simplify the administrative infrastructure of delivering care um you know if you want to be a certified electronic health record in this country you should have a data structure that is aligned with quality programs from the US federal government period full stop um but again, we don't take these things on because they're not as sexy or as interesting. But you know what I'll say is, um, and this has been a recent experience. I talked about my having lost my father. Um, I had it was one of the first times I had to really interact with our federal bureaucracy. I called Social Security to tell them that he had passed, um, and I think it was because of their you know process automation. 
they they actually mislabeled me as having passed. And it's taken me more than a year to resurrect myself. Um, and it's required calls to, you know, people I know in positions of power and influence to really kind of help me undo this. Um, and when I get on the phone with them and I ask them, hey, how how often does this happen? They say, oh, it happens all the time. Um, like, we don't have an effective federal bureaucracy as it relates to the administration of our program. So these days, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, I'm I'm like an effectivist, is what, I, is what I tell people. Like, I just I just want things to work the way they're supposed to work. Um, and I, I think we're really focused from an ethics perspective. We're focused on the problems of the few instead of the problems of the many. Um, and I actually think this is one of the challenges with our health equity movement is like we're trying to like bring up people who, you know, who are really doing badly in a system where most people are doing pretty poor. <laughs> and like, I think the question is, is like the best way to bring up people who are not doing well is to bring up the whole system. And so if you really want to pursue health equity, like make a better healthcare system for all, instead of saying like this small group of people is like particularly disadvantaged, I think we can kind of bring that up 5%, 10% and like feel good about it. When in fact, like the real way to make healthcare better in America is to is to make healthcare better for everybody. That's that's my view of it. Sachin, I'm I'm pulling an audience question um, is kind of a segue maybe to some takeaways. Uh, so our uh, colleague David Sontag has asked, um, what advice do you have for convincing uh, existing hospital and system leadership to be more deliberate and intentional in their decision making and taking an ethics lens to it? without at the same time implying that they're doing it all wrong. So I'm I'm super pessimistic about this. And I'll just tell you, I've just been in, you know, this this particular issue because um, I'm an executive. And if you read any like book, I'm a CEO, been a CEO for 10 years now. If you read any CEO handbook, it's mostly about like how to survive in your job. <laughs> it really is. It's like, be paranoid about your board, be paranoid about this, like worry about that, like, you know, balance this against that. Um, and I would just say like, you know, there's, there's something that's, that happens to you along the way, which is like, you get, you forget why you're there. Uh, you end up being focused on staying there instead of like using your position for good. Um, sometimes it's because you're spending more than you make. I mean, I'm just being, I'm giving you some like observations from the field. So like the idea of like betting your job, um, is, is a, is a really hard one for people to swallow. So I actually don't think it's going to come from the seat, like re-educating CEOs because they're not even leaders. They're, they don't think about themselves as lead. Like they, they use the label leader, but I'm not saying, I don't believe that they actually think of themselves as leaders. I'll tell you why. They will, if they, they will walk away from a, of a, from a poor person's health plan program in a minute, if it improves their bottom line and it increases their ability to get commercial lives. Um, and there's like de facto rationing happening all different ways, like where they place their clinics, how how they organize you know how to, how they organize and structure their system, um, how they treat people in the emergency room. There's all kinds of levers. So like this stuff is so deeply like burned into some people's heads uh, that and the and the duplicity is even like normalized. Like they don't even they don't even realize that the thing that they're saying isn't the thing that they're doing. Um, and it's so uncomfortable for them when you actually call it out candidly. Um, it's just like uh, you know. It, it, it's it's like they just see right through you when you actually bring it up. So I, I would say like the, the real work has to begin at the board level where people actually are a little bit more open to this kind of thing. Um, and they're, they're, I think most board members are actually pretty curious about their role. Um, like the most good board members, they're like, how do I be a good board member? Um, and they have the security of like, hey, I'm really, I'm fully in charge for the most part, right? Like there's no, you know, I would get fired for impropriety, but I'm otherwise like sitting on this board. And so like, I, I actually think that the real movement begins with like an IHI or someone like that building a board education program and then really aggressively enrolling people in this, um, making it available for free, you know, holding it at a, like at a great place. Um, like that to me feels like, you know, so that people feel like they have to come uh, and they're getting something out of it. And, you know, this is, I can't think of something more important for like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or Commonwealth Fund to be funding today. I'm calling a lot of folks out, asking them to do things. Hopefully some of you are on the call. I really think like this is this is the work right now because healthcare is different. It's not the same. 
medical ethics are not the same thing as corporate ethics more, more generally. There are trade-offs that need to be contended with every single day. And the answer isn't margin over mission every single time. I love talking to you, Sanchin, so much. Um, it's, it's, and I know the others on the line do, because I don't know if you've gotten to see all of the like hearts and clapping hands. Um, but it's so validating because I've always said that when I write papers, the imagined audience for me is the wary board member, like the board member who's sitting there and just feels like, oh, this isn't quite what I thought it was going to be. Or like, mm, really? That's the tack we're taking. <laughs> but they too have the same like, I don't know, am I going to be the meeting stopper? Like I'm kind of new here. Maybe I don't know the business well enough. Um, and in the spirit of final thoughts, I just really want to underscore your skepticism about no margin, no mission. I think we've allowed it to become our permission structure for just unmitigated pursuit of revenue and profit. And that certainly wasn't, I think what Jim Sabin and Zeke Emanuel and Steve Pearson initially meant it to be. Um, and it just, can't stand and the industry maintain sort of legitimacy and public trust. Um, it's just sort of like a non-starter. Eventually this train will stop and people will no longer buy it. I don't know how close to that end we are, but as you said, unfortunately, maybe it's a worse before better situation. Um, those are my final thoughts. I, I wanna pass it to you and Kelsey to offer any final thoughts you might have in the last three minutes. Do you want to leave us with anything? Yeah, I would just say I really appreciate the space that you're creating here, you know, to kind of even contend with the collision of management and ethics. Um, and I think it's just, it, it's it's very unique um, and it needs to happen more. So I just want to express my gratitude to you all. Uh, I think it's a great collision. And we really just want to express our gratitude to you um, for, for coming in today and both you and Lauren, really. I think that, um, you know, in this work in sitting in the Center for Bioethics, you know, there's a lot of question about how do we bring the commitment we have to training and ethics and thinking about our moral commitments and our social compacts, you know, and all of these really important foundational values for structuring our healthcare system. How do we bring them out into the world, right? In, an, in a meaningful and realistic way and, and bring people along with us instead of saying something like, you've got it wrong, right? Or it's broken and it's your fault. Um, and so to really hear kind of what it looks like from the perspective of practice and leadership and how you're bringing it along with you, I think is incredibly instructive for all of us. And even to hear kind of, I think a hard thing for a lot of folks in the room, which is, as you put it, ethics training or kind of the, the word ethics even might, might not be the right framing because it seems so inaccessible or it really brings your head into it heady places that feel like you're you're kind of in a zero sum game in a sense. Um, and so, you know, I think I want to emphasize that uh, one of the things we're always talking about is that there's this wide landscape of morally permissible opportunities, right? We, we've just got to be able to figure out how to take them instead of saying there's only one answer here. And if you don't do it, then you're wrong. Um, and that moral courage and integrity is not necessarily something that comes from formal ethics training. Uh, I don't know that ethics training hurts that, uh, but that's just as important, you know, I think to, to really cultivate um, in practitioners and leaders to create that swarm, um, you know, that you really referenced earlier on. So I thank you for the time that you've taken today. Um, thank you. You're leaving us with. Um, I've just dropped into the chat for those who are willing a survey um, link. I'd appreciate your feedback. It's more so about what more we can bring to this forum that will be instructive for you and um, supportive for you in your work going forward. So please go ahead and take that survey if you would. And I will close today with gratitude um, and a wish for a good weekend to both of you and everyone else. Thanks, Thanks so much. All right. Talk soon. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye.